midfielders. There it is, it's over. Yes. Bowden! There it is! Does the streak continue? It does! That is unbelievable. That is fine. The Demons are Premiers! Ash Barty. Australian Open champion. Hello and welcome to Offsiders. It says something about the plight of the once mighty West Coast Eagles that a 75 point loss to Brisbane at the Gabba last night almost seems like a pass. Beaten by more than 100 points last Friday, the Eagles had just 21 fit players to choose from due to COVID and injury this week, while their coach was also forced into isolation. The crisis deepened after photos emerged of two players at a crowded Perth nightclub last weekend, defying club orders to not go out. Just four years on from a premiership, the club is now at its lowest point and there's likely to be more pain ahead. This is starting to become a bit embarrassing for the West Coast Eagles. The Tigers have won by 109 points over the West Coast Eagles on their home track here. The Eagles have suffered another blow ahead of their clash with the Brisbane Lions. Coach Adam Simpson will now not be available entering COVID protocols. West Coast is now struggling to find 22 fit players in time for Saturday's game. It's unfair. That, that is, so, so you think they should be postponing oh, this game? I, I think they, they should, yeah. The Eagles are tonight in crisis with the coach blasting players for parting before the club's latest COVID outbreak. Among the crowd, Eagles players Jackson Nelson and Josh Rotham. By Tuesday, Nelson was in isolation. The outbreak claiming eight Eagles plus the coach. I was disgusted to tell you the truth. They know the, the circumstances that uh, we're facing as a football club and they know the circumstances that they've put us in. Who's there waiting? McCluggage! McCluggage for three in a row! Everything is falling their way. And the Brisbane Lions grind out a 75-point win. Yeah, it's, it's different circumstances and quite unique. I've never seen anything like this. Footy can be brutal. They'll fly home into another week of negative headlines. Our panellists this morning, Corbin Middlemass, Caroline Wilson and the recently retired Opals captain, Jenna O'Hay. Welcome aboard. Um, Corbin, you're a Perth boy. Is this rock bottom or have the West Coast Eagles got further to fall? Uh, it's pretty close for West Coast. I don't think they've ever missed the finals for more than three years in a row. And judging by the way they're going at the moment, it doesn't look like they're going to play finals for the next couple of years at least. They're headed towards a rebuild. Um, the, the interesting part of this is trying to work out how much of an impact the uh, COVID sweeping through the group has actually had. They were injury ravaged in the preseason already. Plus, if you sort of followed the West Coast Eagles over the last couple of years, um, I feel like this cliff has been coming. I mean, this was a team that topped up thinking they were still in the premiership window, traded away first round picks. They haven't had any elite talent, any top 10 picks in since 2010. Uh, and now all of a sudden they are in a sharp decline. So um, that's amazing. Four results in a row for this proud footy club, an average losing margin of, uh, of 82 points after that win against Collingwood, which sort of leaves you scratching your head. How on earth did that happen? You're right, how they beat, beat Collingwood. And, you know, there's really two buys at the moment in AFL, isn't there, with North Melbourne as well. So if you're lucky enough to draw West Coast and North Melbourne twice, uh, Geelong and Adelaide, I think, are two of those clubs, then you're pretty fortunate and it's, you'll go a long way to making the eight. Uh, look, I don't think they're as low as they were during the drug scandal of the mid-2000s, which was a, a cultural crisis at that footy club that took a long way to come back from. To their credit, they came back. Um, the man at the helm then, Trevor Nisbet, I think, offered his resignation at the time. He's still there. He saw them back up to the top. I, I've always admired that, you know, someone who admits their mistakes and rebuilds a footy club. They've got a lot of money, more money than any other club in the AFL, massive resources. So I think the North Melbourne problems are more deep-seated, Kel. But this is not just COVID or injury. There's something wrong at this footy club. Further reports have emerged overnight of three more players in including Jake Waterman, also out clubbing, apparently last weekend, either just after the Richmond game or the next night. Um, there, there is an issue at that footy club, and I feel a massive correction is on the way, whether it's the coach or whether it's a complete you know, revamp of their this management system, but something's going to change. You're right. It, it's not just COVID. It reeks of unprofessionalism when you link up the, the series of Well, Trevor Nisbet said on ABC Radio yesterday that those two first players have put their careers at risk. So yep. what about if there were a further three when they were told... 
don't go out, we need you. And they had to play Josh Rotham last night because they were scampering for players. They were literally ringing around late on Wednesday night, um, ringing waffle players saying, will you sacrifice a game just to come and maybe be an emergency? So they arrived in, um, in Perth at 6am this morning. Jenna, um, 30 players from this team have now had COVID. From an athlete's perspective, how difficult is it to overcome? I mean, we're not blaming COVID. We're saying there's a series of other issues. But from an athlete's perspective, when you come back, how difficult is it? Extremely difficult and obviously everyone deals with COVID differently but I know for me once I was out of isolation it took me another three weeks to I actually got back to training and playing because every time my heart rate rose I would faint. Uh, so it really affects the body really differently so I just hope all those West Coast Eagles players can get healthy and get back out onto the field. I, when, I wonder if it's really an exciting time for West Coast too where they've been a shutters down football club for such a long time, Caro, where they don't buy into the wider debate. And as you said, they're one of the uh, most well resourced teams in the competition because they really haven't had to step outside their lane. They just got to keep the ship going straight. They've got people queuing up to be members of this footy club, but they have been out of step with community standards in recent times. So they had um, a player obviously that was hesitant to take the vaccine, so susceptible to low quality information. They had a player trying to tamper with his, his drug test in the not too distant past. They sacked their Aboriginal liaison officer during the COVID period. Uh, the pride jumper in the AFLW and the way that they subsequently handled that. They didn't have a women's team initially. So I wonder if this is an opportunity for them to think, where do we want to go as a footy club? Is this a chance to, to start something fresh and really move into um, a new era of what the West Coast Eagles have been rather than trying to be the, the same force that they have been for the last 25 years? Yeah, when, when you put them all together like that, um, you see how much culturally they've let their standards slip again. And... Um, they had a shocker of an off-season, Kel. Did. Corbyn's outlined all that. And they had a shocker of a COVID. They didn't handle that well either. So you're right, there needs to be a massive correction. And in my experience, um, the coach is often um, one of the people who becomes part of that correction, I hate to say. And, and there's always <clears throat> the, the question about whether this threatens the integrity with the fact they only had the 21 available. But what are the other options? They would have had to postpone round two. Then they would the have had to postpone made round eight. They eight. laid down the rules at the start yep. of the season. Exactly. Fremantle seemed to do pretty well yesterday yeah. with five players missing. Well, free on Melbourne, as far as the actual players are concerned, I think the Eagles had eight across... Uh, the whole club, so staff and obviously the coach included. Um, I mean, Fremantle were missing more players on the weekend from from their starting lineup due to COVID than what the West Coast Eagles were. Essendon were missing five because of sickness, not COVID, but sickness, and they finally woken up at the MCG last night against the Hawks, finding back from 25 points down to kick the last seven goals of the match against Hawthorne. Um, you were there, Corbin? Oh, I was. Uh, the place was rocking in the final quarter at, uh, at Docklands when the Bombers came rattling home, so they kicked eight goals to one in the final quarter. Uh, Peter Wright kicked six up front. It was the, the circuit breaker that Essendon desperately needed. Um, I think the problems are still very much real and they're there. They leaked over 80 points again. They've, they've had a problem trying to, to keep teams down um, defensively in, in recent weeks and that continued last night. But given the drama that happened before the bounce, so five players out with illness, not with COVID, but just with uh, a separate illness, um, including Jake Kelly and Mitch Cleary was reporting last night that he, he wasn't even able to make it up the stairs and he's uh, at his house yesterday, so he was really ill um, and really a sixth new face in, uh, in Alistair Lord, who made his debut as the unused Matty sub, which is uh, a bit of the um, unfortunate quirks of the, uh, the modern game. So Peter Wright kicked six goals, Tom Lynch kicked six goals at the G as well. Um, gee, wouldn't the Suns like those two forwards, Caro, if they had their time again? But yesterday at the G, it was, it was all about one man. It was all about Dustin Martin and the comeback. And they're beautiful scenes, really. Um, we love champions in sport. So heartwarming to see the Richmond champion, Dustin Martin, back in his happy place. It was fabulous. Uh, Tom Lynch really stole the show in the first half. One of the great half performances I've ever seen by a full forward and um, he's having a terrific season. But the roar when Dustin finally got that first goal, he, he took a while to come into the game, didn't he, Corbin? There was a, about 15 minutes he looked like he was going to be better for the run. But the roar when he ran out, um, the, the ovation for both the goals, that really um, raw moment after the game when I heard, heard Shane Edwards interviewed and he said, I looked around and saw him and just thought, thank God. <laughs> thank God he's back. But um, no, look, it was um, 
It was a big game. It felt like a big Saturday afternoon that we don't see very often at the MCG anymore and it was fabulous. So he took six weeks out for personal leave and Jenna, you've, um, sp you're an advocate for mental health and you've spoken before about um, your time away from the game, that you, you paused the career momentarily for mental health reasons. When do you know and how difficult is it to get to that point to know I'm ready to come back? Everyone is very different. Uh, for me, it was just so great seeing him back on the field and enjoying himself and especially seeing his smile singing the song after the game. Uh, so I hope he continues his journey and really looking after his mental health. And uh, yeah, there's no one better on the football field than Dusty. So it's just great to see him back out there. Jenna, Richmond never privately never felt he was gone from the game. They always felt he'd come back. Obviously, he might have himself thought that he just didn't want to play anymore and they were confident if they handled it properly and they've handled it very well that he would find a way back. Did you ever think when you took time off with your personal reasons that it was finished for you? Yeah, I really did. Uh, I was not in a good place. I was very low and I was the same. The Southside Flyers uh, gave me great support and I think that's really important. And, you know, family, friends and your club supporting you is really important. So I'm glad that Dusty felt that support and the Tigers were able to support him to be able to get back on the field. And hopefully he continues to play for a lot more years because, yeah, it's a real thrill watching him play. Certainly is. It was very heartwarming at the G. Um, the Suns stunned the Swans, but it was what happened before the game at the SCG. Adam Goods returning with his Premiership teammates from 2012 to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of that Premiership. It's good to see him back, Caro. It is. He's, he's been to the footy, he's been to Swans games, but he sits in private boxes and he has never walked onto an arena since his very, very sad retirement in, 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 in Sydney. I think it was at the Olympic Stadium a few years ago. He continues to haunt as a story the current AFL administration, Gillan McLaughlin, Auckland, Richard Goiter and his commission, both not at the helm, Goiter, but on the commission at the time. All that terrible booing happened over those that last year for Adam Goods. And it's just going to be one legacy of Gillen's time at the AFL that he's not going to be very proud of. He wasn't as strong a leader as then as he was now because he'd just come into the job and he couldn't handle a divided commission who refused to believe what was so obvious to all of us. In saying that it hasn't been a great week for the AFL, um, Gillian McLaughlin is over in America working on the next broadcast agreement. He but, actually um, got back, he's, he's just got back. Okay, yeah. the Herald Sun exposed a leaked report about female umpiring. Um, they've been accused of burying this report because it was so damning. And Carrie, you wrote in the Age yesterday that it's a, a week of self-inflicted pain for the McLaughlin administration. Yeah, look, um, I don't think they did bury it in the sense that they tried to hide it. I honestly don't think enough people of importance and influence actually read it, which just tells you, tells me, Corbyn, that umpiring, again, an afterthought. Women umpires, an even bigger afterthought. Game development at the AFL, really... They had a really strong leader in Dave Matthews some years ago before he was moved to New South Wales to plug a hole there. And I'm not sure that game development has been strongly led ever since. Another um, yeah. change at the top now with um, Rob Ald taking over. Big report going to the Commission on Tuesday week, a gender action plan. But, gee, it looks like... It, it's not too little too late, but it's pretty shameful, some of those anecdotes that we read no, from women umpires. No doubt. And, and I wish I was more surprised, to be honest, reading it. It feels like the AFL in general as an industry has had a problem with respect for women the whole way through. So whether that was you know, players, club land, uh, AFL head office, and at the elite level they've worked really hard to try and tra change that culture really over what the past five or ten years or so. Um, but it's going to take longer than that to change uh, as it filters down the grades. And we've obviously seen that at uh, a grassroots level where a lot of those anecdotes have come from. There seems to be a bit of a disconnect too between uh, sort of head office and Gillen's administration where I think they've, they feel like one of the best things they've done for the game has been the way that they've treated the grassroots level, whereas I don't know, the people I speak to in community footy, they feel like they've been let down a little bit by the AFL. So I'm not so sure that um, that, that relationship's as healthy as what uh, I think the AFL would like to betray. I think that's an understatement. Melbourne plays the Saints today, trying to remain undefeated. The reigning Premier in the NRL, the reigning Premier, was beaten for the first time this weekend. So the Penrith Panthers were upstaged by the Parramatta Eels. So it's the first time they've lost a game this season, Corbin. You mentioned the Demons in the AFL, Kella. I, I feel like it's the same in the NRL. But the competitions are too competitive to think that we're going to have teams go on these long, undefeated runs. Um, and I think it says more about the Parramatta Eels than what it says about Penrith. I mean, we know Penrith are uh, the defending Premier. 
Premiers, they're going to be thereabouts. Uh, Parramatta have this in them. I think there's that great Michelangelo quote where sort of in every slab of stone there's a sculpture waiting to be discovered. And I, I feel like that when you watch Parramatta play, that Parramatta, there's a, there's a title winning team in there somewhere if they can just piece it all together. Their, their best is clearly good enough as we saw against Penrith. Uh, but they also chuck in a loss on Easter Monday to yeah. uh, the West, West Tigers. Tigers. They were heavily beaten by the Cowboys. So if they can, if, if their best comes a little more closer to their consistent performance, um, I think they can really contend. They've got a, a great halfback in Mitch Moses, who's a star. Gutherson at fullback. And um, we talk all the time about the, sp uh, the spine and, and Reid Marnie, obviously, is their, is their hooker, is, uh, is an above average in his position. So um, I like what Parramatta are doing. And when you think of Manly, you think of the Trebojevic brothers. And their star is obviously Tommy Turbo and then the brother Jake. But no, it was the youngest in Ben who produced his, not only his first try here, first try of the game, but he produced two tries yesterday, Manly, with the win over the West Tigers. Yeah, started in the centres. He, he played a, uh, a pivotal role yesterday. It was the first time that all three of them have, uh, have lined up together in the starting lineup. Uh, Manly led 18-0 over West, and, and really that was the, the game from there. I think the Tigers drew back within a converted try at one point before Manly uh, put their foot on the gas again, so oh, I don't know how to rate Manly at this stage of the season. They're sort of a, a fringe top eight team. Um, I, I'm not sure I have them in premiership contention just yet, but uh, nice story with the Trebojevic boys all playing together nevertheless. Absolutely. Happy, happy Mother's Day, obviously, for, for their mum. There's a defining moment in Tasmanian sport later this afternoon, Jenna. Um, the Apple Eye will host the Game 2 of a grand final series in the National Basketball League in the NBL because the Tassie Jack Jumpers, well, they came into this competition. It's their first ever season. Not only did they scrape into the finals, which had them... Well, Wild celebrations in Tasmania, but they took out the defending champs, Melbourne United, during the week in the semis and they dropped game one to the Kings on Friday night. Game two of the grand final series is later this afternoon in Tasmania. What have you made of this? It's just such a feel good story and an absolute fairy tale for a new team in the league to make the grand final. And I think uh, no one saw this coming, myself included. Uh, they just never give up uh, the way they play, the way Scott Roth has them all playing. Uh, they play a terrific role. Uh, they all know exactly what they're doing on the court. They have beautiful ball movement on the offensive end. Defensively, they're just on a string and all working together, and it's just a joy to watch. So really looking forward to watching them this afternoon. Uh, Jalen Adams, the NBL MVP, got injured in game one. So it's just a completely new series now. We don't know how long he's going to be out for. So I think the Jack Jumpers will definitely... Well, not definitely. I think they have a really good <laughs> chance of winning this afternoon, and then they go back to Sydney and see what they can do. You know all too well what it's like when you you're trying to get a new team up off the ground. You're part of Bendigo's first season in the competition. I was back in 07, 08, and there was a lot of teething issues that year, and it was quite difficult. Uh, you know, they'd never had a professional team before, and so they were learning on the go. And it's just so impressive what the Jack Jumpers in the NBL have been able to do this season, and it's just a really exciting time for Tasmania. I feel like, General, I mean, you're, you're the basketball person, the, the Josh Adams appointment. So you, you have to get obviously your imports right, and it feels like tremendous roster construction that. They picked him, of all people, to be their floor leader, to go and get an experienced point guard, someone who knows his game. He's not looking for another job over in Europe or whatever it may be to come in and, and run the show for Tasmania in year one. Yeah, and he has some confidence about him as well. Some of those shots he hit against United were just huge. They just completely silenced uh, John Kane Arena that night. And I expect him to put a better showing on this afternoon. And, uh, you know, with Jalen Adams out, um, it's the Josh Adams show this afternoon. What have you made of this cartoon on the back page of the Mercury? during the week. I thought this might have caught your eye. Uh, Gillan McLaughlin with the umbrella as the basketballs fall down around him. Is the AFL watching this closely? Oh, they'd have to be. I mean, this is the biggest sort of Tasmanian victory since that, you know, the Big V was beaten back in the 60s <laughs> by the Tasmanian team. And that was a bigger story, I reckon. 1990 um, it was, that yep. year. Well, well, yes, but the, there was a famous game in the 1960s right. when it was a, a serious Victorian team. Not, no offence to that team that lost. Um, <laughs> look, now that Jeremy Rockcliffe is in power, um, he needs to sit down with Gillan McLaughlin. You know, this has, I don't think this has happened yet. I fear that there is a cash grab going on from AFL commission level administration level towards Tasmania and that the change of Premier will, will influence that even more and I really hope it doesn't come down to that, although obviously there has to be a lot of money put in by the Tasmanian Government. How did we ever scoff at the name Jack Jumpers? Isn't it fantastic? Sorry, just <laughs> no to change yep. subject. Yeah. It's brilliant. It works so well. Um, 
Gillan McLaughlin has a lot on his plate, but this is a play that he needs to make a priority and he needs to catch up with the Premier in the next few weeks. Yes or no, with the outgoing Premier, obviously, got one leaving and Gillan outgoing now as well, will there still be a team in Tasmania? Yes. Go. Opening weekend of the WNBA season in America and um, plenty of Aussies in action as well. Of course, the biggest name is the walking human headline, Liz Cambage, who's been dubbed Liz Angeles after she made the move to Los Angeles Sparks in the off-season. This is her sixth WNBA season, 12 points in 24 minutes as her team beat the defending champs Chicago in their season opener. What have you made of um, Liz's form, I guess, in the opening game and how do you think she'll go in LA? Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, she's always wanted to be in LA, so I think she's happy that she's there, and when she's happy, she plays really good basketball. I think uh, the news story for me out of that game was, though, Annalie Maley, uh, a rookie for Chicago. Uh, she was the WNBL MVP this year, and she went over to training camp for the Chicago Sky, and, you know, she played really big minutes yesterday. Uh, the coach put her in in the third quarter, and she barely came off again, really trusting her, putting her, in overtime, putting her on in overtime and just doing really well. So super proud of her, and I would love the story to be around the wonderful Opal uh, who have the World Cup on home soil later this year. But it's not, of course, <laughs> because it's about the walking human headline in Liz Cambage. Uh, dumped by the Opals, she spoke to the ABC um, in Los Angeles in the last couple of days. In fact, the New York Times did a double-page spread on her. Can you believe this, Caro? They love her in America and they did Didn't not... Didn't read anything about Australia There was no story. mention of Australia. There was no mention of the falling out with the Opals. Of course, um, Jenna was her captain for a long time um, as the Opals player. This was her talking to the ABC um, when she was asked about the split from the Opals. I'm living my best life. I'm supported. I'm protected on a level that the Opals or the Australian team never gave to me. My heart lies with those who want to protect me and those who want me to be the best I can be. Um, and I never felt that in the Opals at all. So she says she never felt supported in the team that you led. How do you respond to that? I can hold my head up high and say that I always loved her, always cared for her, always supported her, always had her back. Uh, I think that is her reality and I think the listeners and watchers out there can believe who they want to believe. Uh, but, yeah, I can hold my head up high. And, and this all started in that um, training game or the, the pre-Olympics game when you played Nigeria and, and it's never really emerged what happened but I've had it confirmed from a few sources. Is it correct that they were playing Nigeria and Liz Cambridge was, had her feathers ruffled and she turned to them and said go back to your third world country and of course Ezi Maggabor is, uh, is originally Nigerian, a Nigerian who's now living in Australia and playing for your team and as a re result there was a brawl that erupted and since then you haven't spoken to her. That is all 100% correct. Will she ever play for Australia again, do you think? No. Mm. So this is the part I, I cover a lot of women's basketball. I do the WNBL, obviously, for this network, and um, I've covered a championship team, which uh, obviously Jenna played in uh, alongside Les. I, I find it staggering, to be honest. And Basketball Australia have never detailed exactly what went on and, and how we got to this position, that the outcome is one of the most dominant players on planet Earth, who is Australian, is never going to represent Australia again. And it's almost just this acceptance that we don't want her to play for us, and she doesn't want to play for us, and that's it. And it's it's finished, and there's almost nothing left to say about it. Um, yeah, I, I, I just I feel like with Liz, they they look like a podium team, or they're almost a guaranteed podium team every national tournament they play in. Without Liz, um, we saw what happened at the last Olympic Games, and unfortunately, they're sort of scratching around trying to be a, a quarterfinal team. Is that unfair, Jenna? Uh, in all due respect, she pulled out seven days before our first game at the Olympics, so we didn't have a lot of time to prepare without her. Uh, I think that there is just so many wonderfully talented basketballers in Australia. Uh, we've got so many playing over in the WNBA at the moment. There's plenty here in Australia as well. And so with the right preparation, I think we can do really well on home soil at the World Cup this year. And I just, you know, there's so many great role models who play basketball that young boys and girls can look up to. So I really want the, you know, media to focus on those players who want to be Opals and who want to represent Australia and who are really dedicated to Australia and I think that's really important. There is Izzy Magbagor, as we can and see, playing yesterday for Seattle. Um, Sandy Bondello is up there with Ange Postacoglu as probably our two most outstanding coaches on the world stage. Has Sandy done enough to keep try and keep Liz in the Opals team, do you think? Everyone's done more than enough. Uh, we have sacrificed a lot to try and keep her in the program and, you know, she doesn't want to be here anymore and that's her choice and we need to move on without her. So I think, uh, you know, Sandy is going to put the best team forward uh, for the World Cup this year and I'm really looking forward to watching them play and, uh, 
yeah, I think that needs to be the headline story. Looking forward to that World Cup in September as well. Can't wait. Mention Ange Postacoglu. He may be on the verge of producing Australia's greatest footballing achievement next weekend. He's taken Celtic overnight to the brink of the Scottish um, Premiership title. 4-1 it was over Hearts. Caro, last week in an exclusive interview that he did with Offsiders, he credited you for the early days encouragement. So <laughs> there you go. You've got one hand on this trophy, Caro. It's, it's very kind of Ange to say that I was encouraging, but he was such a great panellist on the Offsiders and um, he was very easy to encourage. What have you made of, of this achievement? Oh, it's extraordinary. And you just wonder where he's going to go next. And I'm just really sorry he's not coaching the Socceroos to be terribly um, Australian and patriotic, Corbin. No, I agree with you on that. I mean, we've seen, obviously, uh, footballers come through and make it on the world stage. But for a coach to do it, I think it's, it's elevated again. It's I mean, the, who'd have thought that an Australian with football now all of a sudden goes over to, to coach, has success in Japan, has success locally, takes a team to the World Cup, wins an Asian Cup and, and now on the brink of a, uh, a Scottish Premier League title with Celtic. Can I say this seriously looking down the barrel? I think Victoria is the home of football at the moment um, because we've got Ange Postacoglu and, of course, the Premier Plate in the, in the um, A-League still up for grabs with three days left to play. Three Victorian clubs still in the running for this Premier's Plate. Melbourne victory 4-1 win in the Big Blue last night over Sydney FC and it featured some astonishing goals. That's uh, D'Agostino. This is Adam LaFondra with the equaliser, Corbin. Mm. And then Brimmer with this spectacular free kick sensational um, goals, each of them. That, la uh, that last one from Bremer as well on the spot kick. Uh, huge win for Melbourne Victory. So all of a sudden they're, they're the clubhouse leader to, to win the Premier's plate. They're two points clear. Uh, Melbourne City have a chance to try and win it back. So they play Wellington on Monday. Um, City really shouldn't be in this position. They dropped a game they weren't expected to against Perth Glory midweek. The other team that is mathematically possible is, is Western United. They play um, a fellow finals contending team in Adelaide uh, that's today, in fact. Uh, they would need to win that and make up goal difference. So I think it's unlikely Western United will finish on top. It, it really comes down to that, uh, that game between City and, and Wellington Phoenix on Monday. And the never-ending A-League regular season is nearly at an end. <laughs> and then we can finally talk about finals. OK, final tip or observation, Corbin? Uh, just before we do, happy Mother's Day to you, Kelly, and to Caro, and to all the wonderful mums out there, including my mum, Helen, as well, who I'm sure is watching them <laughs> in WA. So happy Mother's Day, mum. Um, Daniel Ricciardo is my final tip or observation. Observation. So this is a guy that's gone from the face of Australian sport. He was at Red Bull. There was talk he could go to Ferrari, ended up going to Renault and then makes his way to McLaren. And now he could be out of the seat. It's remarkable to think uh, sort of how sharp the, the fall is uh, in, in this game. And, um, yeah, he's doing everything he can just to, to hang on to his spot at the moment in the F1s. Caro. And on the subject of Mother's Day, happy Mother's Day, Julia, my mother and my daughter Rose over in Amsterdam. And why do the AFL continue to try and bury Mother's Day and not promote it? One of the games of the round is being played today at the MCG at lunchtime and it should have be become a heralded day and some sort of great um, tribute to mothers. Instead, it'll be a poor crowd and the AFL will blame Mother's Day when they could have celebrated it. Top four clash as well. Much anticipated exactly. clash. Yeah, exactly. good point. Jenna. Firstly, a special happy Mother's Day to my beautiful mother, Mari. And obviously, I'm on here to talk basketball. So it's <laughs> round two of the NBA playoffs at the moment. And I think the Phoenix Suns will take out the championship. Ooh, OK. I like it. Thank you. It's great to have you as part of the panellists now that you are a former <laughs> athlete. Um, I just wanted to mention briefly as well, Sam Kerr just continues to get the awards. She won another award this week. This is Footballer of the Year Award in England alongside Liverpool forward Mohamed Salah. 18 goals in the Women's Super. League. Corbin, they play tonight. It's either um, going to be her Chelsea or Arsenal that'll win the championship. Tough matchups for both. So Chelsea play the fourth place Manchester United and West Ham play Arsenal. West Ham are currently sixth on the table. So um, all to play for for Sam Kerr and, and her team tonight. Happy Mother's Day, Caro. You've Thanks all mentioned Kel, your mums. You so happy too. Mother's Day to Maz and all the super mums out there. It's been a weekend of upsets from the Suns beating the Swans to the Eels toppling the Panthers. But the biggest of them all might have come this morning in one of the world's most prestigious horse races. An 80 to 1 outsider named Rich Strike stormed home to win the 148th edition of the Kentucky Derby. No one saw it coming. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Get rich 
strike, lightning strike. That's one of the biggest upsets in the history of the Kentucky Derby.